Acts 8.25, uh, and we're going to go to the end of the chapter, and we've come to the section which I've entitled Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, a very interesting section of scripture. Starting at verse 25, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, into the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he should come up and sit with him. <clears throat> the place of the scripture which he read was this. This is going to be Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. He was like a sheep, like led to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shears, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, or justice. And who shall declare this generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as he went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water, and what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Ozitus, and passed, passing through, he preached in all the cities, till he came to Caesarea. Now I won't quite get through all of that, but uh, I'll get through a major portion. In Acts 8, 26 to 40, Luke records the second phase of Philip's ministry. God had sent Philip to preach in Samaria through his providence, the way he worked things out. He fled the persecution in Jerusalem by going north unto Samaria, a place that Jews did not like to go. So it's the ideal place to go if you're fleeing from a Jewish persecution. This trip, as we have seen, led to the spread of the gospel throughout Samaria. The apostles Peter and John go to Samaria, they confirm Philip's work, and then have a preaching mission through the, a number of Samaritan villages. We look at that in verse 25. <clears throat> Before they return to Jerusalem. And we noted, of course, obviously Peter's not the first pope because he was sent by the other apostles with John. He, did, he wasn't given the orders. It was a, a mutual agreement. In the second phase of Philip's ministry, God sends Philip by a direct communication from one of his angels to go to the road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza to speak and explain the gospel to one person, just one person, an Ethiopian eunuch of great authority. So there's a shift from the Samaritans to a Gentile, a single Gentile, who was a convert to Judaism. With the Ethiopian conversion, the gospel will move from Judea, or Palestine, to Gentile, or heathen Africa. The gospel of the good news of Christ's redemptive work and his kingdom is radiating outward and in ever-widening circles from Jerusalem to Samaria, now to the uttermost parts of the earth. Philip, this Greek-speaking Jew from the dispersion, plays a crucial role in the expansion of Christ's kingdom. 
As a Jew from the dispersion, he is used to first bridge the gap between Jews and the despised Samaritans. Now remember, the Jews hated the Samaritans. They had no dealings with the Samaritans, and the apostles were absolutely shocked when they saw Jesus speaking with the woman who was a Samaritan at the well. First, it's a shock to speak to a woman. Second, it's a shock to speak to a Samaritan. And they wanted her to leave. Then he is used to bring the gospel to the court of Ethiopia. <clears throat> it is interesting and noteworthy that God has the gospel here go to Africa, not in Lower Egypt, among the large population of Jews in Alexandria. A very large group of Jews were there, and that's where the Greek Septuagint was translated. But in the more distant interior land of the Ethiopians, which is past Egypt, in God's plan. Well, there are a number of things to note about our text. First, Philip's call to this new task is recorded in verse 26. Now, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. The call to go comes from an angel of the Lord. In this crucial period of redemptive history, God at times employed angels holy angels, to give instructions to his servants. We see this when an angel appears to the disciples as they watch Jesus ascend up into heaven. And he, the angel explains to them what's going on and explains to them he's going to come back in like manner, which means in the same manner, a literal bodily descent. <clears throat> no details about this appearance are given, only the fact that the heavenly messenger gives instructions to the evangelist to go. And, of course, he promptly obeyed. When Philip is near the Ethiopian eunuch, he is given instructions directly by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to him. Now, Philip is instructed by God through the angel to go in a totally unexpected direction. He is to take the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, the word translated arise has our sense of get ready to go at once. Arise. Let's get going. There were two possible ways to go to Gaza. One cut to the west, and then down the coast to Gaza. Now, when you think of that Gaza, that was the new Gaza, and that's the Gaza that we have today in that general area. The other went southward from Jerusalem to Hebron, and then went west to Gaza. The second way is intended by the comment, this is desert. This is desert meaning this is the desert road. It could also refer to the old Gaza, which was destroyed around 96 BC by the Maccabean prince Alexander Genicus. The city was rebuilt in the Roman period in 57 BC on the orders of the Roman general Pompey. But the new Gaza was built on the west along the coast. So there are two Gazas. There's the ancient abandoned Gaza, and then there's the new Gaza, which is in the general location of the Gaza we have today, which is uh, full of uh, Muslims and terrorists. A road from Egypt still went through the ruins of old Gaza, which traveled north through Jerusalem. The ruins of the city were referred to as Desert Gaza. So in the old days, if you wanted to dis distinguish between the new Gaza and the old Gaza, you, the old Gaza was called Desert Gaza. In any case, Philip understood these instructions which were very specific. He was not to go through the populated sections of the country, but on a road that goes through uninhabited, desolate areas. All this to witness to one person. Now, if you could imagine, you're, let's say you're preaching in Sacramento, California, uh, a very popular city, and you're having great success, and then God tells you uh, to go to a, a road through an old abandoned mining town in Nevada, because there's one guy God wants you to witness to. That's essentially what's going on here. It's very interesting. <clears throat> to witness to only one man. Well, there's a lesson here about God and his salvation that we should not miss. Salvation originates in the sovereign will of God before the foundation of the world, and it is directed to specific individuals in history. 
not all of humanity without exception. The preaching of the gospel is designed to save and gather in the elect from every nation. God is not trying to save all men without exception and is not interested in saving the non-elect. I know that may sound radical to you. Now, when people talk about the free offer of the gospel, and, and, and you know, it's a genuine offer. Well, it's genuine in the sense of simple logic. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you will be damned. Well, that's a true statement. But to take that statement, which is a true statement, it's a, it's a basically a conditional sentence and it's, it's essentially in the realm of the subjective. It's not saying God wants to save all men without exception. It's just saying, if you believe, and God commands all men everywhere to repent, but that does not mean that God is sincerely trying to save every individual, the elect and the non-elect. And this kind of passage and others prove that. If the Armenian scheme, which is rank heresy, is true, it would be unwise for God to send a great evangelist like Philip to the middle of nowhere to witness to only one individual. You see, the Arminian scheme is based on the humanistic idea that uh, all men are equal in the sight of God. And they're not. God loves the elect. He hates the reprobate. God is not trying to save all men. But if God loves specific individuals from before the foundation of the world, and Christ suffered, bled, and died for specific individuals that are really, truly, and actually saved, then God's instructions to Philip make perfect sense. God loves this Ethiopian so much that he sends a great evangelist to explain to him the gospel. So God's unconditional excuse me, God's everlasting love is unconditional and specific. It is directed to specific individuals throughout history. If you believe that God, Christ died for all men without exception, and God wants to save all men equally throughout the whole world, whether, people, whether they're going to go to hell or heaven, whether they're elect or non-elect, uh, it's just absurd. The Chinese didn't get the gospel until the 1800s. Why? If God really wanted to save the Chinese before that, he could have sent hundreds of missionaries to China. So you got, you got to get this idea, this idea out of your head that God loves all men equally in the same way and God's trying to save all men equally in the same way. No, God's trying to save, God is really saving the elect in history. This point is supported by Jesus' statement to his disciples after they asked him why he spoke in parables. You know, the, you know, Lord, you want people to believe in you, right? Why don't you just speak plainly? Why are you speaking, speaking to the crowds in parables? Well, Jesus answered and said to them, quote, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, <coughs> given by whom? Given by God, obviously. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him will, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, what even he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the Isaiah of prophecy is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will not hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you will not, uh, excuse me, hearing you will hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you will see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people has grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have, they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Matthew 13, 11 to 16. That would be an incredibly bizarre statement to make if Jesus was really trying to save all men. I'm going to speak in a, in a, in a kind of a vague way so these people here will not understand what I have to say. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Here's what Paul says. Excuse me, here's what our Lord said in John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And Paul says, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the natural man, that is the unregenerate man, the person who's not born again, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. 
So in this example of the Ethiopian eunuch, we see the triune God working out of his love to his people, the sheep, the elect, in history. Christ died for specific individuals, and those individuals are actually redeemed, saved by Christ. And to deny this is just rank heresy, and it's absurd. All the, all the words in the orbit of what Christ achieved at the cross, expiation, he removes the guilt of sin. All of it. Past, present, and future. Propitiation, he removes the wrath of God for sin. That follows expiation. Reconciliation. God is angry with the sinner, but now that the sin's removed and the wrath is removed, God can have a wonderful relationship with saved sinners. Redemption. Christ paid the price in full, not in part, in full. And then justification. That person who believes in Christ is declared righteous in the heavenly court by God the Father on account of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when you look at what Christ achieved at the cross, to say that God, Christ did that for all men, yet men go to hell, is to say nothing but stupid heresy. In verse 27a, we read that Philip immediately obeyed. Even though the orders probably sounded strange from a human perspective, he arose and went. He did not struggle with the order or debate the order in his mind because it came from God and he's going to obey God implicitly and directly immediately at all times. To leave in the midst of a thriving ministry to go to a deserted desert road may seem absurd. But the man of faith knows that God always knows what is best for us and what is best for his church. By his obedience, God converted the Ethiopian and Christ's kingdom was introduced to a whole nation of black Africans. This obedience that flows from a whole heart of trust in God's word stands in stark contrast to many modern Christians' commitment to humanistic pragmatism. The Bible's teaching on theology, ethics, and worship is often ignored for what seems right. And like I've said this many times before, you can look at what is, what goes, what is called Christian television today. <clears throat> these mega churches, these guys with tons of money and they can go on TV. And I want to hear about Christ. I want to hear the, the whole focus of the whole Bible is about Jesus Christ and what he did. Who he is. What did he do? You don't hear about Christ. You hear about this is good. It'll help you make more money. It'll help you be happier. It'll help you have whiter teeth. And the second... In the rest of verse 27, Luke, 20, uh, Luke tells us about this Ethiopian eunuch. And behold, the man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, or treasure, had come to Egypt to worship. First, he is identified as a man of Ethiopia. Ancient Ethiopia, which in the older part of the Old Testament is called Cush, uh, Ezekiel uh, 29.10, uh, was much larger than modern Ethiopia. It extended from modern Anwar Dam to the Nile River southward into the Saban as far as Khartoum. It included a large section of land on the west coast of the Red Sea. And its main cities that were, uh, were located along the Nile River were Meroe, Napata, and Kerma. These areas were populated by Nubians who even in ancient times had a, a developed culture. In fact, the, the culture of the ancient Nubians was more sophisticated and more highly developed than the, the modern black African tribes with their spears and their simple hunting and gathering. It was a culture that had a lot in common with Egypt with buildings and structures and all sorts of things. <coughs> And these were most certainly lands populated by black Africans or Negroes. And to the Greeks and the Romans, Ethiopia represented the outer limits of the known world. Rome did attack Ethiopia uh, at times uh, before Christ was born with uh, very poor success. And that's why it remained, uh, it was not a Roman province. Now, he was a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. The fact that he was a eunuch indicates that he was a true black Ethiopian 
who was a proselyte to Judaism and not a Jew who happened to arise to prominence over the Ethiopian court. Now, why do I say that? Well, he's a true eunuch. Eunuchs had their testicles removed, which was totally against the law of God. A Jew would not disfigure his body to become a eunuch. To do so, he would be, would be not only unlawful, but it would have disqualified himself from important cultic functions. In all likelihood, this Ethiopian was the first black African converted to Christ. As a Gentile proselyte, and as a man whose body had been disfigured to be a eunuch, he could not be, uh, he would not be permitted to the inner sanctuary at Jerusalem and would only be allowed in the outer court in order to worship. Here's one passage that speaks to that. Um, Deuteronomy 23.1 says, The one who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. So if it's an accidental thing or it's deliberate, either way, you're considered unclean, you're not allowed into the inner court. And that's the case here. Clearly, with the conversion and baptism of, the, of this Ethiopian, we have proof that the middle wall of partition has been broken down between Jew and Gentile. Now, interestingly, the Greek word for Ethiopian, ahitheops, ahitheops, comes from the two words, atho, which means to scorch or burn, and ops, which, and ops, which means face or countenance. Thus, the word indicates not just the nationality, but one's race or ethnicity. Race or ethnicity. He was certainly a black man. At that time, there weren't white people living in Ethiopia. And by the way, the title Ethiopian or Ethiopia goes all the way back at least, at least to the 8th century BC. Before that, you might be called a Kushite or something. So, clearly, God loves black Africans purchased by Christ, and they are full members of the Church of Christ. Full members. Any concepts of racism, whether kinism, or the Aryan Brotherhood, or the Ku Klux Klan, or the Identity Movement, are unbiblical and satanic. This idea, and it's, it's stupid from a logical perspective. Anybody who studied uh, history, ancient history, uh, the inbreeding and so forth, uh, a black African is every bit as much as intelligent and uh, as, as, as much a man as a German, or a Swedish man, or a Dutch person. There's no difference between blacks and whites whatsoever. They're identical as far as uh, uh, their ontological being. They were created in the image of God. They're all created in the image of God. There's no lesser human and higher human. Racism comes from the theory of evolution. Racism does not come from the Bible. It it's really comes from secular humanism, and it spawned Planned Parenthood, and it spawned the Nazis, and it spawned all sorts of racism in the United States. That the people who claim it comes from the Bible don't know their Bible. And you can listen to my sermons on kinism uh, for confirmation of that, where I, I show that the kinist arguments are absolute nonsense. So God loves black Africans purchased by Christ, and they are full members of the Church of Christ. Any concepts of racism are unbiblical. Christ saves people from every nation, people, and tongue, and brings them into his one church, one body, one spiritual temple. Any philosophy that teaches churches ought to be segregated by race or ethnic group explicitly contradicts the word of God, is schismatic, schismatic and heretical. Racists, all races, should be disciplined. They should be barred from the Lord's table if they don't repent, and they should be excommunicated if they do not repent. Because Christ has one people, one church, and it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter what race you are, whether you're Eskimo or Hottentot or Ethiopian or Swedish, it doesn't matter. You know, the problems in Africa today are because Africans have either accepted 
Islam, which is a satanic religion, or Marxism and socialism, which they got from the, Euro the white Europeans. So don't blame it on the color of their skin. They got socialism and Marxism from Europe. The Ethiopian was a man of great authority and power within the court of Candace. He was a very high-ranking government official with, within the Ethiopian court. The statement of great authority is one word in Greek, dunastes, and can be translated lord, potentate, or ruler. The fact that he was the treasurer of the queen, who was the head of the nation, of the nation supports the statement of his high position in the court, and also indicates that he was completely trusted by the queen. Who are you going to put in charge of the money? Well, it's going to be somebody that you have a, a very high regard for ethically and somebody that you really, really trust with your money. And as a Jewish proselyte, he could be trusted. Now, Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians, is noted by at least two secular historians, Strabo and Pliny. Candace has become a common name, but during Ethiopia's history, it was the title of the Queen Mother who ruled in the place of her son. Okay, it's become a name, but it was originally a title. Scholars believe that Ethiopia had a matriarchal culture and was ruled by a dynasty of queens, all of which were called Candace. And interestingly, the first boat of German Lutheran missionaries that went to Africa, the boat was called the Candace. And it was a very successful mission. These, these were Lutherans before liberalism turned the, Lutheran, uh, the big Lutheran churches into synagogues of Satan. They were still Bible-believing back then. <clears throat> So it's like the term Pharaoh or Ptolemy, which became titles for different lines of the Egyptian kings. In Ethiopia, the royal descent was by way of the mother. The queen mother transmitted the inheritance to her son, her oldest son, but herself exercised the rule. And though the son was regarded as king and given divine honors, he was confined to the palace while the mother reigned. It was truly a matriarchal culture. In the year 21 uh, to 23 BC, in those years, the one-eyed, uh, that's the estimate of when it occurred, the one-eyed Candace, she lost an eye in battle, fought the Romans, and saved her kingdom uh, by a really kicking, uh, hitting the Romans extremely hard, and it gave the uh, Ethiopians a favorable peace. So it was a woman ruler and a woman military leader. Third. Luke tells us that the Ethiopian eunuch was, on his, uh, eunuch was on his way home reading the book of Isaiah. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. <clears throat> that he traveled as far as Jerusalem to worship, a journey of over 200 miles on some very difficult roads and climates, shows his strong piety as a Jewish proselyte. Now he's in a chariot showing he's rich and he's reading the book of Isaiah, sitting down probably, or maybe standing, indicating he's not driving the chariot. He's got a servant driving the chariot. So he wasn't standing there holding the reins reading, reading a scroll he, or a parchment. He was probably relaxing while somebody drove. So his wealth can be seen in the fact that he was riding, sitting in a carriage or a chariot, and he was probably driven by, a, uh, by an attendant who was not mentioned. There were probably more than one attendant because these roads could be dangerous. He possesses a Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation of the scriptures, which would have been copied by hand and very, very expensive. In the, in the, in the days before the printing press, which comes around the, around the year 1500, Gutenberg, Gutenberg Bible is the first thing printed. Uh, before that time, everything was hand copied. And all Christian religious books and Bibles were hand copied by monks. And because they were hand copied and because paper was very expensive, books were for rich people. The common people didn't have a book. And even in the Middle Ages, when books were cheaper a little bit, uh, if you wanted to read the Bible, you'd go into the church and you'd have to read. Of course, it was forbidden to read the Bible to Roman Catholics. But there would be a Bible. Uh, there were periods where there would be a Bible chained to the pulpit. People could go look at the Bible, but people didn't have their own Bibles. So thank God for printing and for capitalism. 
He possesses that Greek Septuagint. He is clearly educated, for he can read Greek, which was not his native tongue. He's from Ethiopia. They didn't speak Greek in Ethiopia. So he knows Greek. And you have to know Greek uh, to do trade. Greek was the universal language in that time. And, uh, of course, you had to know Greek, if you, or we could have learned, I guess, Hebrew, but it's much easier in Africa to get a Greek Septuagint because of Alexandria than to get a Hebrew Bible. Now, in ancient times, it was common for people to read aloud to themselves. They thought it was better for memory, and thus uh, Philip can hear him reading. This Ethiopian had enough knowledge from the scriptures to understand that the, uh, the Bible <coughs> instructed him in the only way of salvation. And thus he eagerly focuses his attention on Isaiah 53, which is one of the most blessed prophecies about Christ and his precious salvation. At this precise time, this precise moment, which, by the way, once again, we see God's amazing pro divine providence in these events. You know, what are, the, what are the odds from a human perspective of encountering this guy reading Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8? like a, a choice passage when he, when he runs up, when he, when, he, when he walks up to the chariot. The chariot was going at a slow pace so he could read. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit tells Philip, go near and overtake this chariot, verse 29. The verb go, go near or go to means not just to approach the chariot, but to also arrive at it and make contact with the Ethiopian. Speed up, run up catch up to the chariot, make contact. In verse 30, we see that Philip immediately obeyed the Holy Spirit. The chariot <clears throat> was traveling at a leisurely speed so the Ethiopian could read, so Philip had to simply run to catch up to it, to the chariot. Note that we have a proof text here for the personality of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told him to do this. A mere energy force or emanation does not give verbal instructions to men. Okay, this idea from certain heretical groups that the Holy Spirit is just an impersonal force or an energy of God is totally heretical. Electricity doesn't talk. And then fourth, we have the interaction between Philip and the eunuch, which gives us an excellent lesson on witnessing in verse 30. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? So Philip ran, ran right next to the chariot, and he could hear the Phil Ethiopian eunuch reading the Greek Septuagint version of Isaiah 53, 7 to 8. <clears throat> Philip clearly knew this verse by heart, and he knew that it was a prophecy regarding the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. He immediately realized that he had the perfect opportunity to witness to this Ethiopian. Instead of simply explaining these verses, he had tact. He asked a relatively, uh, a, re uh, a relevant probing question. There were, this was an interruption, but a friendly, helpful interruption. It shows the Ethiopian the need to understand what the Bible says, and it makes the, Ethiopian, his, the Ethiopian's ignorance of the verse explicit. The question which was asked in Greek, the, le the, Greek, the language common to both men, is a play on words. Listen to this. Genoskes ha anagenoskes. See the play on words. The verb genoskes means to perceive, understand, or know with realization or understanding. The eunuch openly acknowledges the ignorance of the section of scripture. But because he really wants to know the meaning, he answers Philip with a counter question. How can I know unless somebody guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. Verse 31. The eunuch perceives that Philip, who was a Jew, could help him understand. The word translated guide is the same word used for the Holy Spirit guiding the apostles into all truth in John 16, 13. The eunuch was humble. And he was not embarrassed or too proud to admit that he needed help in understanding the scriptures. We have to have that spirit. <clears throat> if you're reading something and you don't understand what it is, find someone who does. 
or find a book that discusses it and seek fuller meaning. Now, I went to seminary in Philadelphia many years ago, and I didn't go to Westminster. I went to uh, Reformed Episcopal, but I had new people at Westminster, and I knew people that had known John Murray. And uh, John Murray was very humble. And if you asked him a question of theology or a question of exegesis, and he wasn't 100% sure, he would say, look, I have to get back with you on that. Let me study that further. And then he would get back to that person in a few days. We have to be humble. If we don't know something, it's best to remain silent and study the matter further. Don't guess. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that goes on on the Internet where people are debating and they're not really doing good research, a lot of it's just worthless. We must always be willing to submit when we do not understand a passage or doctrine. And we must seek out reliable, qualified Christian men who may have more knowledge and understanding than we do. To really understand the scriptures, one must be a Christian first. For as Augustine said, the New Testament lies hidden in the Old. One cannot really understand the Old Testament without also understanding the New Testament revelation about Christ. Everything in the old that seems hard, obtuse, difficult, obscure, comes into focus through the lens of the New Testament. Yes, you need the old to understand the new, but you need the new to understand the old. <clears throat> the whole Bible is about Christ. The whole Bible points us to Christ. And so the New Testament, which is really focused on Christ and his work, once you know that, you can go back to the Old Testament and really understand the Psalms better and the law better and all these things better. Preaching the gospel or witnessing to people about Christ always comes in the form of teaching, which is rooted in explaining the meaning of the scriptures. We find a parallel to our text with Jesus as he went, as he met the two men on the road to Emmaus not long after his resurrection. Here's what Luke 24, 27 says. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And that's where we get the word for hermeneutics, which refers to uh, biblical interpretation. Now, it is sad to think that the Ethiopian eunuch was on his way home from worship at the temple complex. He had just been in the temple worshiping, yet was still ignorant about such a clear prophecy regarding Jesus Christ. This reveals the complete failure of the religious leaders, teachers in Israel, to understand such an important messianic passage, even after the Messiah had come. Now, prior to the coming of Christ, there were a couple of different views on this passage. One was that it referred to the Jewish people as a whole, <clears throat> which is the common view today. And then another one was that it was about the Messiah, and there must be some kind of suffering involved with the Messiah. Well, that view was completely squashed after Christ came because he fulfilled it so perfectly. So. That's why Jews don't believe in the correct interpretation of that passage to this day. In verses 32 and 33, the passage under consideration is quoted. The place in the scripture which was read was this. Here's Isaiah 53 and 50, uh, 53, 7 and 8 from the Greek Septuagint. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? So Luke gives us here the Greek Septuagint translation of this passage, which is what the eunuch would have been reading. The Septuagint has a few minor variations from the Hebrew text, such as the present participle for an aorist, and the statement he was taken from prison and from judgment from the Hebrew is translated, in his humiliation, his justice was taken away. So that is a change. Both are absolutely true, and it's a minor difference. Well, let us briefly examine the rich passage, just very briefly. <clears throat> it first sets before us the atoning death of the Messiah, the sacrificial death of Christ, Jesus Christ on the cross. He is led as a sheep to the slaughter. This prophecy forms the basis of all the New Testament statements regarding the Lamb of God. It defines the nature of the Messianic kingdom. It is established by the death of the Messiah. Now, both the Jews and the Romans believe that physical force, military power and might, the might or uh, force of physical violence in warfare, 
were the characteristics of conquerors. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? You think of a conqueror, you think of some conquest of planet Earth, you think of conquest of nations, you think of force. Tanks, bombs, bullets, missiles. Since there were many passages about the Messiah ruling and conquering the heathen nations and even the ends of the earth, the Jews were looking for a Messiah that had more in common with Napoleon than a meek, humble, gentle Jesus who suffers humiliation and death. But here the Lamb voluntarily and even silently walks to his own slaughter. This indicates that the Lamb of God goes to his death voluntarily. He deliberately went to the cross to suffer in his people's place and take the curse of their sins away by his suffering and death. This is the very essence of the gospel. And this is what Philip preached. This is what the apostles preached. This is not what you hear on TV today, unless you can find R.C. Sproul or maybe John MacArthur. But other than that, you don't see... You could watch an hour of TV and you could learn how to be happier and more prosperous, but you don't hear anything about the death of Christ and the resurrection, which are the, the focus of the gospel. All he needed to do was explain this passion to the Ethiopian, and then he would understand the gospel message. Now, all those in the Middle East and agricultural societies know of the gentle yieldedness of sheep. And I know people that raise sheep and slaughter sheep. And uh, they literally walk up silently and you can just cut their throat. I mean, it's a horrible thing to think of, but that's the way sheep are. They're sheep. They're lambs. This analogy reveals to us the humble obedience of the one who came to obey his father's will, even to the horrible death of the cross. The statement is a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth indicates his lack of resistance to the insults, indignities, injustices, and suffering he endured. He endured it willingly. He obeyed his father's will. He did not put up a fight. He did not put up a vigorous defense. He did not try to escape. He did not seek armed disciples to set him free. He was innocent, yet he knew that he had to endured vicarious sufferings on behalf of his people. He knew he had to suffer. He knew he had to die and bleed out. This prophecy regarding Jesus was fulfilled perfectly, as Philip knew and we all know. Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he ordered Peter to put away his sword. And he made it clear to his disciples that he could summon a giant army of angels at once if he wanted to. And he, only one angel could have killed all the Romans in Rome. Remember, one angel came at night and slew 220,000 Assyrians. If one angel can kill 220,000 warriors, uh, think what an army of angels could have done. And Jesus wouldn't summon them because he knew he had to die. He allowed himself to be arrested and taken to the house of the high priest for trial. Even though false witnesses were brought before who blatantly lied about Christ, Jesus remained silent. Isaiah 53 and 7 and following forms the basis of John the Baptist preaching regarding the Christ. When John the Baptist saw Jesus approaching in the distance, he declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John 1, 29. <clears throat> That's the passage he was thinking of. The Apostle Peter describes Jesus as a lamb that is without blemish or defect. 1 Peter 1, 19. This refers to the fact that Jesus was without sin both as to original sin and actual sin. He was ethically perfect, ethically holy, absolute ethical perfection. And if you look at the old sacrificial system, you could not af offer a, 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 a lamb with any defects at all. It had to be a perfect specimen. Why? Because that typified the sinlessness, the perfection of Christ. If he's gonna die in our place, he can't be a sinner. He has to be innocent. Only the innocent can pay for the guilty in God's system of sacrifice, and that's what he was. He was totally innocent. He was perfect. So the typology of the sacrificial lambs of the Old Testament is perfectly and totally fulfilled by Jesus Christ. The statement, in his humiliation he was despised, deprived of justice, was perfectly fulfilled in our Lord's unjust trial. The silent lamb suffered humiliation 
and in justice in order to die as an expiatory sacrifice. That means he, by his death, he washed away our sin. He blotted them out. He removed them forever before God. The Jewish and Gentile leaders, as well as the vast majority of people, were against Jesus. He was treated as the scum of the earth with the phony trial, the insults, the blows, the rejection of the crowd, the guilty verdict, the torture, the bearing of the cross, the crucifixion before the taunting crowds, his death, his burial, all aspects of his hor horrible humiliation. And Paul describes our Lord's state of humiliation beautifully in Philippians 2, 6 to 11. Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That's the humiliation. Here comes the exaltation. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, including the angels, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of the Father. So, hopefully you're going to confess Christ as Lord voluntarily because you love Jesus and you believe in him as Savior. You believe him as, as your Savior and your Lord, and therefore you call him Lord Jesus out of love and affection because you're a Christian. But every person is going to call Jesus Lord. So that means that the people that go to hell, are going to, they're going to call him Lord too. But they're going to be forced to call him Lord out of fear and trembling because of judgment. In verse 34, the eunuch reveals that he cannot figure out uh, what he cannot figure out about this text. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say of this? Of himself or some other man? <clears throat> the Jews of the first century had no concept of a suffering Messiah. Therefore, the eunuch could not understand the spiritual meaning or fulfillment of this passage. In verse 35, Philip answers him with a detailed explanation of why this verse refers to Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with, at the scripture, preached Christ to him. When Isaiah wrote this prophecy, he was writing about Jesus. Not Israel or anyone else, only Jesus. If we look at Isaiah 52 and 53 especially, we see that Jesus suffered on behalf of others. That's vicarious atonement. He was beaten to the point where his appearance was marred more than any other man. He was despised and rejected by men, by his own people. He was smitten by God as an atoning sacrifice. This is not some arbitrary violence here. God was punishing his son not because the son had done anything wrong, but he was punishing Jesus so he could pay for the sins of his people. The punishment that they deserve was put on Christ, on Jesus. And that's why, A, it was dark for three hours, and B, God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, obviously, the divine nature couldn't be forsaken by God because the divine nature is God and they're one. But the human nature of Jesus was in the severest agony, not from the wounds, not from the torture, not from the crown of thorns, not from the nails in his wrists and feet, but from the separation, this fellowship he had from birth that we don't understand even as Christians. He had perfect, intimate fellowship with God every second of every day. We don't, you know, we'll experience that when we get to heaven, but we don't have that. We have fellowship now, but it's not a perfect fellowship because we're still sinners. We still have that sin to deal with. <clears throat> His suffering was in order to remove our sins or transgressions. All of our iniquity, the text says, was laid upon him on the cross. He died and was buried with the wicked. He was an offering for sin to satisfy God's wrath, just wrath against sin. And by his redemptive work, many will be justified before God. Isaiah 53 explicitly and unequivocally refers only to Jesus Christ. From this chapter alone, Philip could have preached a full-orbed gospel. Vicarious atonement, expiation, propitiation, redemption, justification. All the key elements of the gospel were preached to this Ethiopian by Philip. So you talk about perfect timing, the perfect passage. Remember, the New Testament hasn't been written yet. 
So this is like, you know, if you're going to pick a passage to preach on from the Old Testament, the gospel, this is in the top three, maybe the best one. And so it says he preached Christ unto him. Then what happens? Well, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, clearly, that indicates that there were other doctrines that were explained to him. He, he explained to him, look, you believe in Christ now, right? Yeah, I do. Well, now it's time to be baptized and join the church. And then that raises the question, well, can evangelists or preachers just go out and preach somewhere and just take someone to the nearest river and splash some water on them and baptize them? Well, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but this is kind of an extraordinary text. This man was on his way back to Ethiopia. Philip's not going to Ethiopia. Philip couldn't take this man to a church service and publicly baptize him and have him introduced to the church that way, which is the normal way of doing it, which is the proper way of doing it, a public baptism. He couldn't do that. So I'd say this is an extraordinary instance of a baptism outside of a public worship service. Uh, and I don't think it's a repeatable thing, but it just shows what do you do when you believe in Christ? What's the first thing you do? You get baptized, you join yourself to the church of Christ. We've kind of run out of time. We'll, we'll come back and there's a few things to tidy up here and then we'll continue, Lord willing, next week. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. What an amazing passage. It shows, Lord, your sovereignty, how you use providential events to the benefit of your people. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that Christ is at the right hand, your right hand right now, directing all these events that we may not understand at the time, but we know that we trust you. We know they're for our own good, even though sometimes they're painful. But we also see, Lord, how you show us that the cent centrality of the gospel is Christ. <clears throat> Christ is the gospel. The whole Bible is about Christ and what he's done. So Lord, we ask that you would increase our faith in your dear son, Jesus Christ, that you would increase our love of your son, Jesus Christ, that you would cause us, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit and cause us to think about him all the time and to pray to him all throughout the day and to think about him and to worship him and cause us to hate sin and cause us to hate anything that he would not like so that we can be really solid, rock solid Christians, Lord, for your kingdom. So help us, Lord to worship your son Christ. In Jesus' name.